Good afternoon, everyone. In order to talk about DevOps and security, I'm going to take you back to Detroit, 1982. Things are moving fast. In this year, four million vehicles will roll off the production line in the city. Every day, line workers like this are responsible for seeing 15,000 vehicles move off the production line. Their focus is on velocity. If the wrong brake assembly or bumper is, ava is available for the vehicle moving by them on production, they are to put it on the vehicle and they will fix the problem after release. It is behavior like this that eroded the U.S. automaker's domestic share of the market by 20% between 1962 and 1982. They lost that 20% to the Japanese, who were listening to W. Edwards Deming, who was teaching them some of the key principles of managing their supply chains, to use the best suppliers, to source the highest quality parts, and to track those parts over time if any defects occurred in them. And one of the lessons that Deming introduced in his book to the Detroit automaking executives in 1982, his book Out of the Crisis, was that you can't expect quality into the product, that, that checking quality in the products at the line worker was too late that the quality decisions had to be made much earlier in the supply chain in order to build the highest quality products at the highest velocity. These same lessons were echoed in 2013 when Gene Kim and other colleagues of his wrote the Phoenix Project. In the Phoenix Project, for those of you that haven't read it, you need to order it now and read it. Uh, for, those, uh, for those of you that have read it, it introduces the first three ways, uh, or the three ways of DevOps. The first of which is to understand the performance of the entire system, the performance of your entire DevOps pipeline, and the supply chains, the software supply chains that serve them. And to understand that system and, under, and also know that we are never supposed to pass known defects downstream. It is this perspective that helped guide me over the last four years in writing the State of the Software Supply Chain Report. I'm the lead researcher behind this report, and I'm going to share some of the information that we've revealed in that report over the last four years, as well as some data that has yet to be published uh, in this year's report to be released in June. So for those of you unfamiliar with software supply chains, they act like supply chains in any other manufacturing industry. In this case, we have open source projects acting as suppliers of parts, reusable components, libraries, and frameworks. Those parts are made available in huge public warehouses on the internet. Maven Central, npmjs.org, rubygems.org, the Nougat Gallery, etc. Those parts are then consumed in massive volume by all of us and our software development teams as the manufacturers and put into applications which represent the finished goods within software supply chains. Every one of you in this audience that has an organization developing software is heavily reliant on a software supply chain today. How reliant? If we just look at the Java component download requests over the last 10 years, and even in the last two years, in 2016, Maven Central, which Sonatype, the company that I work for, helps to steward, saw 52 billion download requests. 
Last year, we saw 87 billion download requests of Java open source components. There are only 10 million Java developers on the planet. If you look at the NPM ecosystem for JavaScript open source components, in 2016, they had 59 billion downloads. In this, this past year, they will exceed 200 billion downloads from 7 million JavaScript developers on the planet. What this means in the impact of this is that the applications that we're developing today are mainly created from open source and third party components. 80 to 90% of the typical application today is created from these components. But there's a secret that many of you have not yet recognized. And that's that out of all of these parts, they are not all created equal. There are many of these parts that are very old, in some cases 3, 5, 10, 12 years old, that are still being used by your developers today. They have different license types, some of which are risky to your organization, and they have known security vulnerabilities that you may not be aware of. To paint, to open your eyes to not only the volume of consumption, but the security hygiene of these components. I have been tracking the percentage of downloads of components that have known security vulnerabilities for the last couple of years in this report. And what amazed me, what shocked me, was that last year, 12% of all the billions of components that we've consumed had known security vulnerabilities the day they were downloaded into your organization. Since Heartbleed three years ago, we are twice as bad on our hygiene as we were. Since Poodle and Bashbog and other open source, vulner uh, open source vulnerabilities, since Equifax, we got worse. We didn't get better. One of the ways that we can get better is to instrument open source governance policies in our development programs. The good news is 60% of your organizations have an open source policy in place. The bad news is 40% of your organizations do not have one in place. And if you question your developers about how many of them follow it, you'll find even fewer follow the policy that you have in place that guides principles for selecting the highest quality, most secure components that you're using. Now, all of you in your organizations are not consuming billions of components. The average organization, if we just look at Java components alone, is downloading 200,000 components a year. If you add, if you're a polyglot environment and you're developing in .NET, Ruby, Python, Java, and other things, you can double or triple this number. But just in Java alone, your organization has outsourced the development of these components to the open source community. You've electively, electively brought these components in, and 12% or about 24,000 have known vulnerabilities in them and you are building those into your products today. It's not just that you download the components, it's that these components make their way into production environments. Research released last year by Northeastern University that evaluated 133,000 websites showed that very popular versions of JavaScript components out in production were using known vulnerable versions of those components when perfectly safe versions were available to them. They were downloading and using what's convenient without having the ability to check or understand what they're using. Once these vulnerable components are out into production environments or in your products, the situation gets a little worse when we look at the time between the, when a vulnerability is discovered and when hackers begin to exploit it. 
In 2006, the average time to exploit, according to Gartner, was 45 days. In, uh, in 2015, that had reduced to 15 days. In the case of Equifax, last year with the Struts vulnerability, the difference between when the vulnerability was announced on March 7th and when Equifax was first exploited with that vulnerability was three days. You have to understand what components you're using, where you're using them, and if something is discovered to be vulnerable or risky to those environments, you now have three days to fix it and you need to have systems in place that are automated enough to help inform you when those issues occur and what you can do to remediate them. So in DevOps practices, the great thing about DevOps practices is we've basically set up automated practices to release our software faster, but also automated practices that provide us feedback loops when something goes wrong. So if there's a known vulnerability, not only do we know that we're using a component with a known vulnerability, we can identify that quickly, automatically feedback information to the development teams, and automatically deliver them information about known safer versions of those same components that are available to them. So if they're able to instrument or replace those vulnerable components with safer ones, they can then submit their code to build and have it run through the test and make it out to production safely. Or in the case of Equifax, seeing a known vulnerable version of struts, having a business requirement that says, there's a vulnerable version, there's now a safe version, I have a business requirement to get that into production in the next two days. When managing trusted software supply chains, there is a huge scale of measurable improvement. In the 2016 report, we saw 5.5% of the downloads being vulnerable. But when we measured organizations with trusted software supply chains that were managing their components and understood where they were and corrected defects or security vulnerabilities, license risk, older, com outdated components, et cetera, we saw a 69% end-to-end improvement in the managed software supply chains. So the question today is not, can we build secure software? Every other manufacturing industry on the planet has figured out how to build at high velocity with high quality by understanding what parts they're using, what suppliers they're sourcing from, who has the best track record, and if any defects occur in these environments, informing the environment and remediating those as quickly as possible. Software can do the same. The use of open source components not only makes us more innovative, it allows us to easier track and understand what's being used to build the applications that our businesses are relying on. When you don't follow these practices, someone else may be forcing you to. And those may be the government organizations that are introducing guidelines and legislation GDPR legislation, guidance from the UK National Cyber Security Council, the White House, the US Department of Defense, and several other organizations have released guidelines that say we need to build security into the products that we're using. We need to understand the component parts that we're putting into that software, and if any are known defective, we need to swiftly remediate those risks uh, within the uh, within the software itself. By not doing so, your actions are labeled as gross negligence and your organization can be liable for that behavior. We've already seen multiple lawsuits filed in, this, uh, in these instances where people were using known defective, non-secure parts in their products. So I haven't had a chance to cover all of the data presented in the software supply chain report. But this data, the first glimpse of this data for you is hopefully opening your eyes to how software is really being built. 
to what we're putting into our software, and hopefully some of this data is helping you or can help you to start a conversation when you go back home to your companies and ask what is in your software. If you want a copy of these slides or of the software supply chain report, the last version we produced last year, my out of message office or my uh, out of office message is on right now. It is on all day. If you email me at weeks at sonotype.com, you don't need a subject line, you don't need to say thank you. It will just send the automatic out of office message. There are two links in it. One is to the slides, the other is to the report. They're on SlideShare. You don't need to register for them or anything, uh, but I want to make this information available to you so that you can share it back with your own organizations. Thank you very much, and if we have questions, uh, happy to take them. I'm also around the conference all day, and I have a German colleague with me if we need to have a German conversation uh, regarding any of the, the data or input. So thank you. Thank you, Derek.